Hi guys. Hi guys. I'm very excited because this video was a long time in the making and I'm so happy it's finally happening. And I want to start it off with just saying thank you from the bottom of my heart for every single customer that Attire has ever had. And to all the customers who've been so supportive over the last years and especially the last months. And one of the reasons why I believe that Attire has such a strong future is because despite everything that has happened, we have had daily sales, despite not launching a new collection, not having a team anymore, basically, you know, not doing marketing, not posting on social media. For me, it's like a little wonder. And I'm, I'm so, 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 so grateful from like really the bottom of my heart. Without you guys, obviously there wouldn't be a brand. And I just wanted to emphasize it from the very beginning. All right. So for the first time, I think for the first time, I'm coming online and I don't know what to do. And I've been trying to figure it out for the last year. And we had a lot of almost solutions, which didn't end up happening. And I believe, you know, always everything happens for a reason. And now I'm actually coming online and I'm asking you guys for help. Which is never an easy thing to do but it should be i don't think it's not easy it's just not on top of mind also because i always feel like i need to have the answers but i don't so <laughs> one quote that i live by is that you cannot solve old problems with old solutions so you need to try something new it's like you notice from the simpsons when uh, Bart Simpson is always going to the fridge and opening it and he always gets an electric shock and he keeps doing it and it's like the definition of insanity to trying the same thing. Is it thing Bart or Homer? What did oh, I say? Probably Homer. You said Bart. Yeah, Homer I think. <laughs> <laughs> but like this is what I feel like for the last year. <laughs> I kept opening the fridge and I was getting electrified and I just kept doing it. So we're trying a different approach here, guys. So I'm just throwing it out there and I hope something good will come back. Let's start with a little history of attire. <laughs> <laughs> now you need like a teacher. Yeah, I should have like a... <laughs> like a whiteboard. A whiteboard and like write like a maniac. So 2019 was the year when I decided to start attire. And the reason why I wanted to start attire is because I wanted to wear more sustainable clothing and I wanted to have something that I actually genuinely like. And I saw there was a gap in the market. My mission was always to make the industry better. Like that was always the big idea behind everything that we've done. And you know, we kind of started very naively. Like the way I thought a clothing brand is made is the opposite of what it's actually like. Like it's so much more complex. And also my mission, I was like, mm, I'm just gonna do it like this and everybody will follow and we'll be the leader in the industry. It's not that simple. And I've learned that over the last five years. And you know, we were scouting factories and looking for fabrics. And this was like, to me, like giving birth to the brand was the most exciting time because I think I am really good at that. Like I'm really good in like creating. And looking back, I cherish everything with such fond memories and so much love because it was kind of a magic time. The very beginning was magical. And then, you know, we launched end of 2019 and we had like a crazy launch. It was so successful. We sold out almost everything. It was surreal. And again, thanks to you guys. And then we were planning on doing the next collection and then COVID happened, you know? So 2020, the thing happened that none of us expected and we had to cancel like our next collection. At the same time, because we were sold out of almost everything, there was nothing to sell. <laughs> However, we then continued with the fall collection and I think it was quite good. It was a good successful launch and the year turned out out to be quite good. 2021 was a magic year. Like there was just such a golden year for I think the fashion industry in general. We launched our successful trench coat which up to this day is our number one bestseller and kind of the item that carried the brand so far. And 2021 our expectations were far exceeded and everything was so good and going so well that we were kind of on like a 
hi you know after that successful launch we were like let's take on the world like we were so confident and we attributed a lot of the success to us which is partly true but partly not but i will talk about this later just to give context we were still like a super small team i think we were four or five people back then working on the thing including us yeah so it was like really really a tiny really team. tiny but i feel like well we will talk about it in more detail later but i will mention it already we got <coughs> a little bit arrogant <laughs> yes you know when retailers approached us we were like no we will stay d2c when people requested gifting we were like no we don't give to anybody like we were a bit arrogant and it was part of the lesson to you know go through that to get humbled <laughs> <laughs> we thought we we understood the whole game yeah we know. thought <laughs> we had figured it all out <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the next logical thing in my mind was ooh, it's going so well we continue to sell really well la -da -da -da. let's scale so the way i thought i scale and by the way I have learned that this is a very common mistake. So if you have a brand or you have a startup, listen carefully. The ironic thing is that I knew that. I knew that before I took these action steps and I still did this mistake. So maybe it's all like part of the entrepreneurial journey. But basically my logic was, okay, it's going so well, let's triple everything. And I still remember how we were sitting in front of our little Excel table <laughs> and we were putting in numbers and we were like, really? oh yeah. And <laughs> X3. <laughs> oh yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. Like oh looking back, we're like, it's so funny. It's truly funny. So yeah, we tripled our inventory, which was the biggest mistake <laughs> we've done in entire history. Because what happened is that 2021 was a really good year for the fashion industry in general. And 2022, the first cracks opened in the industry in general but what also happened is that we had less successful items we had a lot of faulty items so unfortunately there were items that were produced wrongly which is unfortunately something that just happens it was the wrong sizing there was mistakes in the making the wrong fabric was used and we had more inventory than ever and that was the beginning of a journey that taught me more about life than anything else I've ever gone through. After going through that turbulent phase, in 2023, I decided to rebrand attire. And not in a way of like change everything, but I feel like in 2022, because we just wanted to be big, we wanted to be more commercial, I kind of removed the brand a bit from myself. And it became kind of serious or like very young and like, it moved away from me and it didn't feel as true to me and to myself as it was in the very beginning. So then I was like, okay, let's make attire Xenia again. And in 2023, we invested a lot of money into the brand. In fact, we invested seven figures into the brand because I wanted to change factories, improve the quality even further, hire the whole team. Like we made so many investments that I was so sure will pay off. And we like kind of went all in. And then the big ugly thing happened and it's like running on like 100 kmh. Like you're running full speed. Okay, we just invested and we went all in, like all in and we're running, running. And then this thing happened and we like hit a wall. Like it, the hit was so strong. And because I have invested so much in this brand, I was like, we need to continue. Like, I know I'm like, I'm not okay mentally, but I need to fight. Like I need to make it work. We came back to Paris. We really tried to make it work. And deep inside of me, I knew this is never gonna work, but I really wanted to make it work. So I tried everything that I could, like everything. And then in, I think it was October or November, reality just caught up because you know the cost kept getting bigger there was so much we had to pay for like a collection that we've developed that we haven't launched yet and it became such a big mountain that i couldn't handle anymore not just mentally but also financially and then we had to make this very difficult decision to close down the office in paris and that was probably the hardest thing with the robbery I've ever went through. Because again, there was so much 
that I put in there. Like I put my soul into this. And it was so painful to make this decision. And I remember I was just crying because, uh, yeah. so many days because also like it's so... The feeling of letting people down for me was the worst. Like, obviously I love our team. I mean, I hired the people, so I love everybody. And like, just disappointing all these people. Or I felt like I was disappointing them. Like my team was handling it so well. And I just felt like such an immense failure. But I also think that I didn't have the tools to deal with it in a, I don't know, not the right way because we all need to like learn and make our experience. But I think I didn't have the right tools to deal with it in the best way. And what I've now learned is that a lot of entrepreneurs go through very similar struggles. And I felt very, very much alone in what I've went through. Like really alone. I felt so alone. And I now know that it's, quite normal and it's okay to struggle and it's okay to fail and it's okay to go through these motions and knowing what I know now I would have handled it differently and I would especially not have put myself down so much because I was putting myself down so much and I think the hardest part that almost no one talks about it is the huge responsibility you feel like we had people working for us that had a family and you just know that you have to like you really feel like you let them down and i think that's even the hardest thing of all things the worst. everyone is glorifying entrepreneurship so much because there's all these crazy success stories and there's so many unsuccessful startups out there where people had to go through so much shit i think there was a series once that i saw it was called fuck up nights where people would tell their fuck ups and i think it's really refreshing to hear from time to time how much you can fail and how much you can learn couldn't agree more and that's the learning we had after you know that phase we closed down the office and then we started meeting a lot of people and we met very 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 successful people because we wanted to learn and the stories they told us i was like you went through like so much more shit than we <laughs> did and That's what I'm saying. I feel like we didn't have the tools back then. And not the experience, you know, you, you just have to learn. But now I feel like we've learned so much. And I think there's still like a mountain to learn. But with the new knowledge that we have and the experience that we've gained, I feel quite optimistic about the future. So now it's 2024 and we're still untangling a little bit of what happened before. Yeah, but... there's still a lot of things to clean up you know, clean up the old mess. But I would call this chapter a rebirth, a renaissance. What do you think? I mean, it's the same. It's kind of like a, like a phoenix out of the ashes. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> Taylor Swift reference. <laughs> yes, rising like a phoenix. So I want to talk about what we want. And it goes hand in hand with talking about what we've learned. And I want to find somebody or a team or a brand that will lead the operations at a time. And I will go more into detail later, but I feel like I need to also talk about our learnings in order to explain what we're looking for. So basically we're looking for a late co-founder, shareholder, somebody who will take a big role in the brand. And I will explain to you where our strengths are and where our weaknesses are and what we're looking for. So number one, one of the biggest learnings is, is that if I were to do everything again, I would hire an operational leader or co-founder right away. And my brain, you know, it's not really designed to be a really good businessy person, like look at hard facts, look at hard numbers. I am really a feeling and intuitive and creative, like through and through. And I feel like I was a bird that was trying to swim. Like I was trying to be a fish. And I almost drowned when I attempted to force myself into the CEO position because like everybody around me, and that's like another le lesson that you know, you need to learn is not every advice is good advice. But everybody around me was like, you will grow into the CEO role. You know, we need more female CEOs. Like you will manage it. Da, da, da. And yes, I try to force myself into this. The crazy part is like looking back and now having this distance, I'm like, what the hell was I going through? I was working myself towards destruction. I was working nonstop. Last year, like before everything happened, I always got sick on Thursdays. Like I could look at the clock, at Thursday I would get sick. Suddenly my back would hurt so 
so much that I couldn't do anything else than laying in bed. Or my belly would hurt so much that I could not go outside. So my body was literally forcing me to take a break. And then I would rest because I couldn't do anything else. And then on Monday I was like, oh great, like let's attack again. And this would continue for several weeks. If your body is talking to you, you better listen. And now looking back again, I'm like, oh my God, I really, I was so deep in it that I couldn't see. And I almost broke down or burned out and trying to become a good COO or CEO and that's the biggest lesson that I've learned because I have friends who are really good at this who get energized by it who are also really skillful at this and you know I had coaches I was reading all these books I was watching YouTube videos I literally tried so hard but it never made me happy in fact it made me really unhappy and that's a big lesson that you need to stay true to your nature and I am a creative like that's what my strength is but because I was trying to do this operational part I really diminished my true self and my creative side and the company suffered from that and I think it doesn't mean that you will never as an entrepreneur have to do something that you don't like like oh, there will always be no. be moments where you just have to do the work but I think the biggest goal should always be to replace yourself with someone that is so much better equipped for the task and we we totally failed yeah, in that like yeah. i also think that your brand or your company is like it, it's its own entity right like it's its own thing it's like a child like a baby and you want to do what's best for the baby or what's best for your brand and me being the CEO was not the best for the brand. Like that's a fact. Which leads us to learning number two is that our business model, which was non-existent, was quality from the very beginning. Because from the very first collection, we had margins that were too low. I was kind of treating entire like a non-profit. And from the very beginning, we couldn't have survived with the margins we had. And you know, a sustainable business cannot work with an unsustainable business model. Well said. I think we, we were just, again, like sitting in front of an Excel table and we were like, okay. But, but the assumptions that we made around it were just totally wrong. We just didn't know any better, but like we also didn't really ask for help or we didn't want to see the truth maybe behind it. We got an ex-CEO of a huge luxury house to look at our numbers, like there was um, in 2022. He looked at the numbers and he was like, he was kind of saying in a nice way, you're doomed, you're doomed. <laughs> and he was already right back then. And it took us still from there. It took us a long time. I, I just to... didn't want it to be true. Yeah. So my thought was that we would grow much faster and our quantities would rise much faster. But it wasn't a reality. So in truth, our quantities were quite low. When your quantities are low, everything is so much more expensive. That's why small brands are so hard. Like it's so hard to sustain a small brand. And once you reach a certain size, it's like a wheel that is rolling you know like everything becomes so much easier but you need to reach a certain size and we we were just so small and we were trying to operate like a big company and then what happened is that our margins were too low to sustain the business um, they were two on average, which looks good on paper, but then you have, you know, the other costs that you don't calculate, like alone our developments for a collection, like one collection was around 75k, which also like we could say mm, that was really expensive. But if you think about it, it's like 2k to develop one item, like for a collection, you develop several pieces, some won't work out, you want to have the best tailor, you want to have the best fabrics, like it's an investment you take and ideally, ideally, yeah, ideally, Ideally. Ideally. <laughs> you do it in a way where you have such a good development that the later on, like the collection will just sell out well, returns will be low. But that's the whole thing that also came on top, like because of this like failed collection in 2022, our returns were double of what we normally had or even triple because we had very low returns before that. And suddenly it was so big. And there's obviously the office, there's the staff, the administration, the web shop, the tax, and the biggest cost of all is inventory. And that was something that really changed my whole perception. Yeah, really my paradigm. Before 2022, we were selling out like 80, 90%. And that's really good because I never wanted to have a lot of inventory. And again, in 2022, with the failed scaling, we suddenly had to 
so much inventory. And this is something that almost broke me because I didn't want to do sales before. Suddenly I had to do sales, but also some items were faulty. So like there was this huge amount of new problems that we had. And again, I learned that this is quite normal and it happens and you, there's ways, you know, there's ways to deal with it and there's ways to handle it. We didn't know better. Now we know better. And it's so funny because I talked to a guy who sold his company for like billions to a very big tech company. And I asked him for advice and we were just talking. And I said to him, if there's one thing that I never ever want to deal with again is having huge inventory. And he just starts laughing. And I'm like, why are you laughing? That's not funny. I just hate having a lot of inventory, like excess inventory. And he was like, you know, it's so funny because every entrepreneur I talk to, they say, I never ever want to have insert problem ever again. So every entrepreneur has his own like big problem and they swear to themselves it's the worst problem to exist. They never want to have it again. <laughs> and it's literally what happened. Yeah, every industry just has its own yeah. like things that you have to deal with. And again, I think we were so not equipped with the right tools and didn't have the experience. So the way I think I dealt with it was very, for me, it was the end of the world. The end of the world. And also you would suddenly understand a little bit better why the fashion industry is the way it is. Exactly. 100%. Like there's a lot of things that like, and I'm, I'm sure there will be solutions yes. like in the future. And, yes. and, and also we would love to be part of the solutions. Yes. But suddenly you really understand a lot of things. Oh my God, you're going to preach. <laughs> and preach. why, yeah. So many things suddenly make sense. And it was such a learning, like that really humbled me because, you know, I'm such an idealist. I want to change the world. I'm like full on Aquarius. I'm like, ah, in a perfect world, it would be like this and that. And then reality catches up with you. You get humbled and you're like, oh, this is why. And just to give an example, but like we just said, like suddenly you have so much inventory and before we were like, we never ever want to go on a sale. And, and why is every fashion brand out there always doing a end season sale? Like we just don't want to do it. And suddenly, and, and up to this day, we, we still don't think sale should ever be part of, of the strategy, but suddenly you understand. Maybe it should be though. Yeah. Even the row has sales, you know, the most expensive brand that I know. So well. just to give an example yeah. out of many, actually, like yeah. there's a lot of examples that we could give. Which brings me to um, not the last lesson, but one very big lesson for me is don't give yourself too much credit for success and don't blame yourself too much for failure. Attire had quick success. And to be honest, I gave our team a lot of credit for it. And rightfully so, because, you know, there were some things that we did intuitively very right. The problem is, that it gave me the feeling that a lot of things are in my control. And 2022 was the first time in my life I actually felt the impact of an economic struggle. And some things are just not in our control. But then I really took the blame on me. And that made me all realize how much luck was involved. Because also if it was so easy and if you could predict everything and if you could predict every bestseller, you could, everything was in your control, everybody would be successful, you know. The fact that the trench coat, for example, performed so well was of course a skill. Putting it together, like designing it. Yeah, but if it was just a skill and nothing else, then we could duplicate it over and over again. And we did. And again, yeah, if it's easy to predict bestsellers, fashion would be an easy industry. And another learning that I have is that small steps in the right direction will take you further than a big risky jump. And what I mean by that is that we started a tire with a lot of restrictions. We put ourselves in a box that is so strict and so small that I feel like it harmed us more than it benefited us. And what would have been better is to be less rigid and implement all these changes through time. So, for example, we could never make jersey items because my definition of no plastic was so rigid. And you know, jersey is kind of in the grayish zone. And today I think it's better to create items made of beautiful fabrics that are long-lasting and, and not forcing a fabric that is maybe 100% super duper sustainable, but not the the right fabric for the item. And you know, there's a reason why jersey is one of the most popular fabrics. And I personally love jersey and I think the restrictions were just too strict and it harmed us in the end. Which also doesn't mean that we will make a full like U-turn. Suddenly yeah, be like, yeah. okay, hey. <laughs> it's not a U-turn, but, but I think you need to, for example, like one rule we also had, like invisible zippers always have plastic in them. And that's a big fault. And it's still after, and within five years, this problem hasn't been solved. And this made us create dresses that may not be as comfortable to wear because we needed to design around it. And now I'm like, for the sake 
of being plastic free, but it will actually make the item worse. Is it really worth it? You know, it's just a question you need to ask yourself. And, and, and again, also to that point, just to add, sorry to jump in, but like, is it more sustainable to create an item that at the end of the day, you want to look good in the dress. So you may, may order the dress and it, it was still a beautiful dress, but the, the fact that we couldn't use an invisible zipper, for example, made it so complicated to then close it. It yeah. was just not looking nice. And yeah. suddenly you produced something that is uh, sitting in the, in the warehouse. And, yeah. and that's not sustainable at all. I couldn't agree more here again. Also, you you know something where I also had a big learning for myself and it's also one of the reasons why I shifted the way I communicated about attire is sustainability looks different for everybody and there's no like just right or just wrong you know and my definition first of all was very rigid because I was so convinced that plastic is so evil and it but like I have learned over the years that nobody buys a piece of clothing just because it's sustainable. Like you need to have a beautiful item, period. And a long lasting item, good quality, beautiful feel. Like it needs to feel, make you feel empowering. And if you buy something from a brand that maybe not 100% sustainable, but it will last you 10 years, it's more sustainable than if you buy a piece from the most sustainable brand ever and you don't end up wearing it and you just not throw it out but you just get rid of it you know what i mean like this is the reality i wish it wasn't like i wish we lived in a perfect world because i am that idealistic but this is the reality and we need to work with that like it wouldn't be smart to work against that a step in the right direction by a huge giant brand has more impact than a small brand acting as if they're the most sustainable brand in the entire world and while it's good to have these ambitions and put in the right effort and having these good values we don't want to live those like oh than the attitude. Is yeah. that how you say it? In Germany we have it like uh, leave the church in the village. <laughs> What does it mean? It means that at the end of the day, you have to leave the church in the village. But what does it mean? <laughs> I don't know. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, but like it means what you said. Don't be holier than the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, why everything is around church in those sayings, you know? I have to be very honest with you. You know, I think one of my faults is that I can sometimes be condescending. It's just one of my things. And I become more aware, so I try to work on it because I don't like it. I also get thrown off when other people are condescending. And I think I was so condescending with my brand. I was like, ooh, like everything we do is so perfect and the and and I again I've been humbled I've learned and I realized that people take different efforts for a better world and all these efforts are good for a better world and it's never cool to be a finger pointer no it's never cool to be a finger pointer but I think it gives you so much freedom to be so real and honest and that's something that for me is such a big learning and that's why I'm so grateful. I always say, you know, sometimes I think about the savings that we put into a tire and I'm like, oh my God, all this like money that we could have, I don't know, invested in other things. And then I just say, we went to a tire university, five years of tuition for two people and we got the best education there is out there. And we learned so much and that's why I am so grateful. Like really, I am so grateful for everything that we went through, for all the tears I've cried. For. And everyone also that was part of the journey and tried to help us make it happen and still will try, try to help us make it happen. And that's a really good point because, and not like the last lesson, we're coming to the end, is that, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. And after we closed down the entire office and I literally hit rock bottom, I was like, okay, what are the action steps that I can take? And I started reaching out to entrepreneurs that I knew, even like very, very successful ones. And I was like, ooh, they will never like meet me. And they ended up meeting us and hearing about their story, only then I realized, oh, it's actually not the worst thing that ever happened that could have happened. Like in, in my head, I was like, oh my God, what we experience is like the worst of the worst. No, everybody's going through shit, okay? Everybody's going through shit. And I realized that the best entrepreneurs had a really good number one mindset. They had a really good way in handling these things. Don't take it too personal. Don't belittle themselves like I did. And they had a really great team. And I think that's the lessons that we want to take to move forward, to, you know, rise as a phoenix from the ashes with a really good mindset and not take it so damn serious, but also get help from just the best team ever. Okay, so now, is there anything else you wanna say? Just that if you know someone or if you're the right one to maybe help us out here, or if you just wanna chat. <laughs>
I think if you're an entrepreneur and you're watching this, I just want to give you the feeling that you're not alone in what you're going through and it's okay what you're going through. And if you think about the worst thing that can happen, I mean, of course, it's super painful and I know how painful it is, okay? So I know it's like literally a baby and if things are not going well, you really suffer and this is all part of it. But you'll be okay. We'll all be okay. It's like me speaking to myself. I'm gonna rewatch it. Yeah, so I hope this will reach the right person. And again, thank you guys. Cannot say it enough. We love you. Thank you. Bye-bye.